Hi there. My name is Kevin, and I'm going to talk to you today about some tips and tricks I learned doing model evaluation in COBOL with my friend Ed. So uh, Vicky Boykus, our illustrious leader, wrote this great blog post a few years ago entitled IT Runs on Java 8. And the premise was that as much as we like to talk about cool new frameworks that let us do cool new things, the reality is that the vast majority of software we interact with runs on much, much older systems. She gave the example of Java 8, but I like to give the example of COBOL. In particular, critical infrastructure that we use every day runs on COBOL. Banks, railroads, Fannie Mae, US Postal Service, health insurance con uh, consultants, they're all currently hiring for COBOL mainframe developers to help them process trillions of dollars in annual transactions, ship hundreds of billions of packages annually. These are really systems that underlie our economy underlie, uh, you know, really all, all of our supply chains. And like really critical infrastructure, you know, it turns out if you're super critical, it starts to be that Congress writes laws about you. And in particular, over the years, Congress has started to require that a lot of these systems actually build models on top of the data that they're pulling in. Ed and I got into this game in particular because of this law, 42 USC 503J, a law from 1994 that requires that every state in the United States unemployment insurance system implement a system of profiling all claimants. So if you lose your job and you ask for unemployment compensation, you're going to be run through one of these models. And the model might say, hey, this person looks like a fraudulent claim. You should ask them for more information or deny them benefits. Another thing it might do is it might say, hey, this person looks like they could use some resume help. Require them to go to resume help or deny them their benefits. These are different things that could happen with the outcomes of these models. And of course, like all models, they have problems, right? You know, for instance, Michigan's uh, fraud detection algorithm has recently been under a lot of fire uh, for having a really, really, really high false positive rate compared to what you'd hope for. And so, you know, these are things that need to be monitored. And just like we all know, you know, you, you put your MLOps infrastructure on top of it, you're kind of constantly monitoring and looking for all your metrics, all your dashboards. And that's a great idea, but you also have to remember that these systems are really old, right? So Florida installed its first UI mainframe in 1972. That's only three years after Margaret Hamilton got us to the moon with a bunch of punch cards, right? These are super, super, super old systems and they have a ton of tech debt. So implementing kind of a modern MLOps infrastructure on top of them is actually really difficult. And so if you're tasked as a model evaluator or kind of understanding what's happening currently, um, you really can't hope to put that MLOps infrastructure on first if it's your task to do the evaluation. I'll give you an idea of kind of scale. Twitter was founded in 2006, and we're already worried about some hard drive filling up in a closet somewhere that you know some SRE forgets about. And so that's only 15 years compared to the 50 years these systems have been around. So we really need to like keep that in mind as we go through things. In particular, kind of top tip number one is that you probably can't expect at least to start a really great data warehouse with lots of you know all the kind of modern tools in the cloud. Um, there's a lot of lawyers involved in procurement here. There's a lot of um, possibly privacy laws that are stopping things from flowing into the cloud. Um, and so you're probably, for your first pass, going to need to get your data locally. So you're going to need to build kind of a local data warehouse. For this, I really, really recommend tools like DuckDB that can hold a lot of data locally. And I really, really uh, recommend things like subsampling or really looking at judiciously pulling data from the database, at least for your first pass. Eventually, you'll be able to build these things into automated systems. But for your first pass, really using these tools and subsampling is a really great way to go. Second, um, Keep in mind that you're not going to get Parquet files from these people. You're not going to get, uh, you know, even CSV files from these systems. You're going to get fixed with files. So these are files where everybody's significant, and there's a metadata file that says how you handle each column of data. And in particular, it might say things like a decimal point should go between columns eight and nine. These systems are really, really notorious for both overflow errors, where columns kind of run into each other and, coll and collide. And they're also really notorious for off by one errors as you interpret, especially where decimal points go. So to help with this, I really recommend tools like Pandera, which can help you do kind of some static type checking and make sure that the values you're getting are sane when you do your import of this data. And I also recommend this query, select max. Right, uh, select max is like such a lifesaver to just check if your orders of magnitude make sense. It's a really great simple query to make sure that you haven't put the decimal point in the wrong place. 
And finally, three, uh, keep in mind that there are actually many different COBOLs, uh, and they're all proprietary, and they all handle missing data differently. Sometimes it's a default value, sometimes it's a programmable value, sometimes it's a, an error. And the only person who can tell you which it is, is, you know, your Margaret Hamilton, your person who's been there since the 70s working on this. So you should really make friends with Margaret and ask her, not, uh, ask her how missing data is handled, as well as other potential, you know, programmatic issues that come up. So these are my top three tips. One, get your data into a local warehouse. Two, be wary of fixed point issues and fixed width issues and do some sanity checks. And finally, three, make friends with Margaret and ask her how missing data is handled. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.